I saw a racer head here. It's showtime, folks. Good evening, everyone. My name is Beth Gilligan from the Coolidge Corner Theater. Thank you for joining us for this special virtual stage and screen presentation. Um, it's a discussion of the wonderful new film, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Um, it is co-presented, of course, with our friends from the Huntington Theater Company. Uh, we've been working with them for, gosh, I've lost track how many years, but it's been a long time. Um, we, par we partnered for this series called Stage and Screen as a way to sort of um, broaden conversations about some of the great works that were being performed at the Huntington. Um, it's, there's a film pairing that speaks to one of the shows that they have going on and a great discussion. And of course, this is normally happening in one of our beautiful screens at the Coolidge, um, but we remain closed, hopefully not that much longer uh, due to the, the pandemic. And just want to express gratitude for everyone who's tuning in tonight um, for your support of both Coolidge and Huntington. We're both nonprofit organizations. Uh, the cultural sector has been greatly affected by this pandemic. Um, and we're grateful for your support and just for the opportunity to connect with you um, for these discussions and events. But I will get things moving along. Um, we have with us Meg O'Brien. She's the Director of Education at Huntington Theater Company, and she's going to be introducing our wonderful panel. Thanks so much, Meg. Thank you, Beth. Good evening, everyone. I am Meg O'Brien, and I'm the Director of Education at the Huntington Theater Company. I'm really excited to be here tonight to really just facilitate a conversation between three exceptional teaching artists who work for the Huntington Theater Company and have an intimate knowledge and um, history with August Wilson and his work. So I'm so excited to have you all here tonight. I would really love to take a moment and ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves to you. Um, we have Naheem Garcia and Keith Maskell and Regine Vital. And friends, hi and welcome. I would love to ask you each uh, to introduce yourselves and include in your introduction the first memory you can think of of experiencing August Wilson's work for the first time. And Regine, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Um, I knew you would do that. <laughs> uh, so my name is Regine Vital. Um, I'm the manager of curriculum and instruction in the education department at the Huntington Theater Company. Um, I'm also a local actress, a dramaturg, and newly minted director. Um, and I, my first memory of August Wilson, um, funnily enough, I, I'm my like true getting to know August Wilson has been through being in the education department. But the first time I encountered August Wilson was at the Huntington Theater Company um, for a production of Gem of the Ocean. Um, my friend and I, my very good friend and I, Jonathan Christopher, we went to see it because Felicia Rashad was in it. And we all wanted to see Mrs. Huxtable <laughs> on stage. Um, and we were sitting in the balcony at the Huntington and watching the show and loving it. And before, I don't know, like 10 minutes out, before the end of the first act, I was in tears, just like crying and in love with what I was seeing and in love with like, uh, the only way to, to explain it is, and we both said this, we went to church that night. Um, I'm not a religious person, but you know, I always remember that day as like, I went to church this evening and I had a spiritual moment. Um, and th that was my first dose of August Wilson. That's beautiful. Keith, I'll pass it to you and then we'll go to Nikki. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Meg. Uh, my name is Keith Maskell. Um, I'm a teaching art artist, of course, uh, with the Huntington Theater Company. Um, I am uh, an actor, producer, and um, founder of The Triggered Project. Um, and um, I'm very excited and, and happy to be here um, this evening. Um, I would say, I was thinking about this today. Uh, I was like, wow, what is the first time that, that I got exposed to August? And um, the piano lesson, I believe on 
WGBH, I believe. And um, I cannot remember if, if my parents were watching it. Somebody was watching it. And or maybe no, I was at my grandparents' house. And my grandmother was watching it. And I just got wind of it. And I just sat under the table and watched it and uh, was really mesmerized uh, by the language. Uh, it was almost like, I was like, what are they saying? Um, and then after watching it, it started to slow down and I could kind of um, keep track of it, so. I love this image of younger Keith sitting under a table watching, I love it. I don't know that I've heard that story before, so yeah, exactly. <laughs> And Nahim, to you, please. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you. I'm transitioning uh, uh, from phone. I got it going. I'm here. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. My first encounter with August Wilson. Uh, I was lucky. I worked at the Huntington. Is everything? Uh, my phone. I'm sorry. My camera just did something. Oh, yeah. Um, I worked at the Huntington, and I think it was seven guitars. And we get invited. I go with a bunch of my friends. We sit at the theater and I'm watching this play that opens up with somebody cutting a chicken head and making a circle and, and watching Keith David do his thing. And, and it was very amazing. And um, August to me was another black playwright who was telling our story. And when I got a chance to get involved and we started getting involved with August Wilson in the education department, that's when I opened up a whole can of here I come <laughs> and there I go. <laughs> so yeah, uh, that was my first encounter. Wow, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Uh, my, my first encounter with August Wilson was in my theater history class in college. Um, I, I, my professor, Michael Bradford, um, was and is still a black playwright and said to our class, and I'll never forget it, if you know two names in the theater in the USA, you should probably know like a Neil Simon, maybe a Tennessee Williams. And he sort of named all of the American playwrights that we had all studied and said, but you have to know August Wilson. And so my first experience was reading Fences in college when I was getting my BFA in acting. And then when I came to the Huntington, Fences was the first production produced in my time here. So there was sort of this unintended circle moment, but to see it come to life, to see it play out on our beautiful Huntington Avenue theater stage was something I'm not sure I can actually describe. Um, so for those of you who are listening to all of us, some of you might be wondering, why is the Huntington Theatre Company coming to talk about Ma Rainey's Black Bottom tonight? And, and if you haven't sort of guessed it, the Huntington Theatre Company had a remarkable and very close relationship with August Wilson while he was with us. Um, August Wilson died in 2005 after a battle with cancer. Um, but the Huntington Theatre Company premiered or was in a co-production with another theatre company seven of 10 plays that August Wilson wrote that is now known as part of his century cycle. Other people might call it the American century cycle or the Pittsburgh cycle. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, of course, is one of those 10 plays. And we are coming to you in April for a number of reasons. One, the Oscars are coming up and the incredible Viola Davis and the amazing Chadwick Boseman are rightfully nominated for their turn in the movie adaptation. We have a deep and vibrant and wonderful relationship with Ruben Santiago Hudson, who adapted the play into the screenplay, is also a well-known and Tony Award-winning actor of Wilson's work in his own right. And we have also produced August Wilson's autobiographical play called How I Learned What I Learned. So there are a number of theaters across the country who have fully produced the entire cycle. We are one of them. And in that moment of Fences coming to the Huntington, which I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, was the 2009-10 season, uh, Kenny Leon, who directed our production, just happened to mention a monologue competition, which we're going to get to a little bit later tonight. 
Um, but everyone that you see who is going to start chatting with each other and less of my voice uh, teach that program and have been teaching that program for a number of years. So we we are all, I think it's fair to say, fairly obsessed with the work of August Wilson. Um, we are also coming to you in April because August Wilson is our Shakespeare. And, and we say that with all of the weight and all of the context and all of the subtext that that holds. He is a poet. He is the uh, American playwright who wrote as many plays and as many good plays as Shakespeare did. And both August Wilson and Shakespeare were born in the month of April. So this is our way to pay honor to August Wilson and celebrate him and amplify him at a moment where uh, black voices need to be centered and amplified more than ever. Uh, so that's why we're here tonight. And I'm just gonna open up the conversation to these incredible colleagues and friends of mine. Um, and I'm gonna start with this little factoid. So August Wilson's Century Cycle is 10 plays, nine of which are set in Pittsburgh in the Hill District, which is where August grew up. One play was set in Chicago, Illinois, and that, of course, is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. So my first question is to any of you who want to start, why do you think it was so important for August Wilson to set this play in Chicago? Why not find a spot in Pittsburgh for this to be set? Hmm. <laughs> no, because, you know, again, in 11 years, I never thought about that one question, the most obvious question in the world, why Chicago? Well, we know that, Ma, where was Ma Rainey from? That's the question. You know, if Ma Rainey was from Pittsburgh, then that makes sense, she went from Pittsburgh to Chicago. I don't know, but that would be the logical Naheem thing to think about. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'm all of a sudden, now, now I'm second guessing my facts. Um, Ma Rainey, I believe, you know, born, born Gertrude Pridget, I believe was was her real name. Mm -hmm. She's from Georgia, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, so, she, so uh, and she was, you know, well well known in the South. So to come north to Chicago, um, I think that's part of it, right? Is that kind of these these folks who are from a particular place, um, a particular region, kind of encountering um, the North. Uh, and what are the cultural moves that are bringing those those folks north? Um, not just, I mean, you know, part of it is the Great Migration, right? Um, mm -hmm. That's part of what the Century Cycle is exploring. Um, just these swaths of Black folks coming up north from the south for all sorts of opportunity. Um, and I, I think that's, and Chicago, I mean, I, I've never been to Chicago, which is kind of a crime, but like, when I think of Chicago, it, it, it's, I don't know, I, it, it's one of those cities, it's not New York. It was the high it's time, LA, wasn't it? But yeah, it's, it's one it of It was those the high places. place. It was the place to be. Yeah, I think, I think as you talked about the migration, um, you know, people that didn't want to go all the way to New York, right? They went to Chicago. And the rich history of theater and Black theater in Chicago is in Chicago. very rich. Uh, the history of music is very in rich, Chicago. and it's a really strong Black community. Um, yep. I've been there uh, a few times, and the love uh, that Black folks have for Black art is second to none. It is second to none. Um, mm -hmm. And that was the, you know, was a, there was a, a, a real togetherness um that i felt when we were in chicago and um it's not like anything else and it wasn't what i expected at all because we're talking about the midwest right we're talking mm -hmm. about the midwest um but uh folks rally folks rally around each other in chicago and it's a it's a beautiful it's a special thing so i think that's something that uh that he wanted to to highlight uh but I, I, the, the the interesting question is why Chicago? Where's the evidence in the play or in the evidence? Now I'm interested. Now I want to go back into figuring out. We I never asked that question. Why Chicago? And why? Unless Meg has an answer, I'd be happy to hear. But it's, you know, <laughs> why Chicago? Because now I'm sitting here saying like, yeah, August, 
Why, why'd you sit in Chicago and everything else in Pittsburgh? What, what's that all about? What's the connection there? Outside of the things that I've just heard, Chicago was the high place to go, the migration. If you didn't want to go to New York, you went to Chicago. But that's a very interesting question. I, and, I, and I feel bad that I don't know the answer to that because that sounds funky. I, well, not, ne not necessarily. I mean, because I mean, it's, it's the place set in 1927. And as I was watching the film, one of the things I kept thinking about was, and I never thought about it this way before, but thinking of the 20s, thinking of the Gilded Age, it's all you, all that comes to mind in that period is Gatsby when we think of like the great literature, the great like stories of the period. And that's all New York. The other thing is the Harlem Renaissance. That's the 1920s, right? And that's happening in New York, but that's not where August goes. Um, you would think if he wants to talk about, I mean, Ma Rainey's Black Box is about a lot of things, but the kind of uh, aesthetic of it and the, the main theme of it is the blues, is this mm -hmm. cultural art form that is making itself known in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and and Chicago is the place to go. But like there's a movement happening in this time period in Harlem, in New York, that's like, you know, center of, of black culture and black art. And August says, no, I'm gonna go to Chicago. Yeah. So that has to be strategic. I mean, yeah. it could be something we're missing and it's super like obvious. But, uh, uh, no, you, you're cooking, you're cooking. Yeah. Cause now I'm thinking, for us here in the East Coast, going to the big city would be going to New York. Mm. So in the Midwest, I would think going to the big city in that time period, you just mentioned it, you know, the blues was big. Chicago was the town. Was, you know, the, uh, Keith just said it. It was the place to be. So Chicago could have been, you know, at, that, at one point, I think Chicago was even a little bigger than New York at one point, especially in the music. Or they were in the same, you know, it's one big town you go to. But I think it was, you're right. Uh, the fact that the people on that side of town can go to Chicago and get the same experience that we would get if we went to New York. That's the way I'm thinking about it. But now I'm fascinated. I'm going to be obsessed with that. Thanks, Meg. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. I am only here to engage in conversation. I don't presume to have the answers. Um, I like uh, that we are maybe creating more questions because this for me is one of the, the reasons why Wilson is so incredible. Uh, Naheem, you have known and have been studying and have been teaching August Wilson for well over a decade now. And so for us to still be discovering and exploring and asking questions is beautiful. And it's what you want from a piece of theater. You want your audience to be asking these questions five minutes after the show, a year later, 15 years later. Uh, yeah. It's it's a beautiful thing. I, I would say that I think, you know, I want to, it struck me, and Viola's maybe the best actor in my time, I feel, uh, female identifying actor. And, and, and she is um, thoroughly, uh, August Wilson is in her bones. She knew him, she worked with him, she has continued to carry on his legacy. She won the Tony and the Oscar for her role as Rose in Fences. Um, and she has made a very active choice to keep a white agent and to keep recording at a white recording studio. And in the film, um, George C. Wolf, who is the director, has allowed for these moments of quiet and stillness where we see Ma's struggle and recommitment to that choice with every microaggression, with every moment that her power is trying, she sees her power trying to be torn away. And I, I wonder, because Ma Rainey is an actual artist who existed in the world, and August spoke often of most of his characters being combinations of the people around him. He would just sit in a coffee shop or in a restaurant and just listen. And he's notorious for having napkins upon napkins of notes. And uh, on Huntington Avenue, that was the Unos that used to be right next door. After a long rehearsal, he would go and he would sit and he would write. Um, but Ma Rainey was real. And so I wonder if there's something to be said for her understanding. She was a brilliant businesswoman, but she also made some very specific choices. And I feel, and this is the piece I really <clears throat> didn't understand until I watched it again, that that studio has something to offer her 
that will continue to allow her to hold on to as much of her power as she can. I, I don't know. It's, I don't know. It was Ray Charles wanting his masters when he left the studio. You know, it's, 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 a, right. it's a matter of, it's my words, it's my voice. Right. I yep. should have the right to use it and to benefit from it. That's right. To be the person that's getting the least out of my talent and my voice is wrong. Right. It still happens today, which, you know, people are fighting over copyright, which is one of the reasons why we're being careful when we're demonstrating or doing any of August Wilson's work right now because of the relationship that the estate has with a big network. So, you know, it, 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 it's a matter of having control of yours and your voice because everything has been stripped from the group of people that August Wilson has been talking about. Let's mm -hmm. see, we're talking about people that were in their own country, got brought here, became slaves, became property, was told they was nothing, everything. How they look in the mirror meant nothing. What you are is nothing. Your God don't even look like you. <laughs> God don't even look like you. So therefore, it is my pleasure to make you my, my, my tool, use you any way I want. You have no rights, you have no nothing. And as we fought through that, to have a voice, to put our words, to get words, first of all, right. you got killed if you couldn't read. And I tell students all the time, a lot of people died so you can read. And I say that to myself, because I was a very lazy reader. I didn't get to read, read a whole lot till I had no choice, because I'm teaching August Wilson. <laughs> <laughs> I had no choice. You know, and I still uh, like that. Because I remember there's a story most of you know <laughs> when I was, uh, my limited time doing understudy for seven guitars, and I go in the hallway. August decided he wanted to change everything and giving out three page monologues and five. And, go, and I said, August, you got a lot to say. Is there any way you can say a little less? He gave me that look, you know, that look, and he and, and, and walked away. But now I could appreciate it because we all have a lot to say. And it's important that everything we say gets heard, not repetitive. I don't want to hear the repeat. I just want to hear you and, and own what's mine and have a voice. And I think that's what Ma Rainey's deal was. Her deal was not only am I a black woman, mm -hmm. she was an open lesbian, yep. open in that time period and did not care and walk proud. And you didn't want to mess with her because she would bring it to your door. As she told them, she sat up there knowing they was hearing, they could too cheap to buy me Coca-Cola. She's talking, <laughs> she don't care. She didn't care. She didn't care. And now let's go, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be, but you done open a can up. So, you know, <laughs> you did. Like I said, you open a can up, here I come and there I go. You know, and, 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 and that's what August Wilson works does because after reading him, you think about your own issues. You think about how many times your work has been taken for granted or not looked at or not respected or not, not cared way. for. You know what I mean? You think about that. I'm going to be quiet now because I know everybody else got something to say about it. But, yeah, that one opened up because, you know, we're still fighting that fight. So this is a, a natural segue. The, the century cycle is a play for every decade in the 20th century following the Black experience of that decade. So friends, uh, knowing the cycle the way that you do, knowing all 10 plays the way that you do, this is the question that you least enjoy me asking in all sorts of other rooms. Um, but if you, here's the other piece I'll add to it. So the Massachusetts State Department of Education has an extensive list of recommended authors that teachers are to choose from to teach the required material. And August Wilson is on that list and rightfully so. Uh, so friends, as educators, as artists, if you could pick only two plays that you want every child in Massachusetts to read and study, mm. what would those two plays be and why? Here you go again, asking those serious, tricky questions. I would suggest you go with the first two plays that came to your mind, because I know you all thought of two right off the bat. Mine's I know set. you did. Yeah, mine would be uh, Jitney, which is one of my favorite, because it talks about the black father and the black son relationship, and that's important. Also, the establishment of business and being an entrepreneur in the community. Uh, and yeah, it keeps hitting me. I learned something. I got, okay, this, I want to split it a little bit. It's a little bit seven guitars and a whole lot of Gem of the Ocean. 
because those two plays deal with a lot of spirituality and identity and finding who you are, why you are, and, and where you're going. Um, they all do, but there's a specific way these plays talk to the characters and to the people. Um, yeah. like, you know, because Jim of the Ocean, this is the first year I really danced with Jim of the Ocean. So I'm sorry, yeah, but that's, yeah. So uh, those are my two, three, two Keith, to three. Keith, I'm throwing it to you. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go King Headley mm. right now, especially with what's going on right now and the, the voice and the struggle of uh, black and brown men. I think that's really important, but also that relationship between him and Tanya and everything that's going on, like mm. that's an intergenerational story, I feel like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like from young people to old, that they can relate to that, but they can really dive into, um, you know, the psyche of King and talk about his mental health, talk about his trauma. And um, I just think that's me. So that's, so that's one for me. Uh, the second is the piano lesson mm. because it's mm. about family. Because mm. of family, right? And the divided family. family. Yeah. Like family issues in there and family heirlooms, right? And the significance of that. And it also tells the story of um, intergenerational stories and storytelling mm. and how important, uh, you know, artifacts that have been passed down are. You know, but then it also just, it's just a great story. I think it's a great story of, of family and how you got to try to figure out how you're going to work it out and the roles of the family. You know what I mean? I mean, hey, you ain't taking that piano out my house. Look at that piano. <laughs> like someone had to step up and, and really talk about that and really talk about that. She, she trying to scare me? Hell, I ain't scared of dying. People see me dying. You know, I see people dying every day. Like this, that's a real story. And I feel like a lot of people can relate can relate to that and um it's powerful so those are the those are the two it was really difficult but those are the two first two that came to me i follow the rules no, I go back. Unlike, unlike when, 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 when done, i want to go because keith done says something really important about uh about yeah this is what you get when you get the three of us in the room the, um, i'm ready the piano lesson Okay, I gotta get it out before I forget. One thing that you you said that that really connected is black folks wanting poor folks wanting to leave something behind for their family. Yes. Yep. And the fact that somebody wanted to destroy that one thing that the family had, family yep. value. You hit it on that key. That was good. Oh yeah, let's go. Mm. Because of course, generational wealth is not a guarantee, particularly in non-white families. And so the wealth that those families could pass along were those items that, and she says, you know, Mama Ola rubbed and polished and prayed. She rubbed until she bled. Her blood is in that piano. So that's that, and that's real. That's not an exaggeration. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really important point that that material item, which also creates, right? It's a piano. There's music that comes out of that. Is is something that her brother just doesn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. No. It, and again, that also he it, it hits. A, I mean, Regine's got to go because yeah. Regine got to go because we got to talk. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Regine, and then I'm gonna hit you with another question. Oh. So be ready. <laughs> um, if. I mean, if I were picking two, I, I mean, like Naheem, I'd, I'd pick Gem of the Ocean because I, 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 I just, I love that play. And I think it's, I think it's gorgeous. I think it's beautiful. And I'm a sucker for origin stories. Um, it's, it was, I think it's the second, the second to last to be written um, and produced, but it is, it is the, it's the origin story of the whole cycle. It's set in 1904. Um, Aunt Esther is like, she is, you know, we talk about the ancestors. Aunt Esther is the ancestor. I mean, that's her name, Aunt Esther, ancestor. I keep saying aunt because I'm from New England. Aunt <laughs> Esther, ancestor. She right. is like, she just, she's this, um, her character represents this wealth of experience and legacy and heritage that we fight to hold on to as black folks. Um, my family's not from, the United States. My family's from Haiti. I was born in the States, but it's it's something that I understand that I'm constantly kind of like 
Comment est-ce que ça va? Ça va bien? Ah, ça va bien. Oh, on va pas les créoles. Ah. Yo no hablo nada de eso. Yo hablo español. This is if, I was my, if, I was my if I was my dad's daughter, I would know a little bit more Spanish and I could answer you back, but unfortunately yeah. I don't. Um, but no, like, I mean, it's it's something, you know, and, and thinking about that, what it means to carry, to carry culture, to carry legacy, to carry heritage, to carry the memories, to carry, you know, the food, the language, the how to be, um, uh, spirituality, all that stuff. It's, I, I, it's something that I think about a lot as the child of immigrants. It's something I think a lot about a lot as a black woman. Um, I'm 36 years old. I don't have kids, and I, that's not a thing that I worry about. But I do wonder who's gonna carry, who's gonna carry after me, right? Like I've got two younger sisters, but not, well, all three of us are grown. But it's not where we're at. So who carries that? The responsibility of that. Um, as somebody who doesn't get to go home to the, you know, to where my family's from very often, how far away am I getting from that? What is it? What will I lose? So when I, when I read Gem of the Ocean, that's always running through my mind. Um, you know, what does it mean to be black in America and what is that identity? What is that culture? And I think that's being carried in the play. And then the second play that I would, uh, I'd probably want to teach and it's tricky because everybody wants to do fences. So I immediately say no to fences. Um, and the reason I say no to fences is because I think Ma Rainey is, is a better option, not just because we're talking about the film, but because there's this way in which it formally, what the play does, how the play is structured, because it's not just the story, right? August Wilson is an amazing storyteller, but as a playwright, somebody working within the form, the things he's doing with Ma Rainey as a play is completely different. I mean, you got four dudes hanging out in a room just talking. And that's the majority of the play. And every now and again, somebody comes in and intervenes in the action or what it doesn't feel like action, but somebody intervenes and then they go out and, and yet somehow it builds and it peaks and it climaxes. Um, and it just, it just doesn't work the way that you expect the play should. And I love, anytime you break the rules, Mm. And it works. Mm. Now that's a master. And mm. August yeah. knew what the rules were because he wrote Fences. Fences right, right. follows the rules. And he said, yeah, I could do that. But you know what else I could do? This. And I'm like, yes, let's talk about that. Because um, I think that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah and, 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 and talking about that, the, the fact there's so much mystique and, and um, I don't want to say yeah, witchcraft. You know, Santaria. But it'll be your practice. Huh? Yes, Andaria, Yoruba uh -huh. practice, all those voodoo, all voodoo, voodoo yeah. you know what I mean? There's a lot of that in his plays. He's using a lot of mystique. We also know because people are breaking rules that they're uh, unleashing all of these evil spirits that are causing these things to happen. I mean, that's, you know, that's when he's talking, that's his Borges, isn't it? That's now he's bringing in Borges technique. He's bringing that mystique. He's bringing in that whole thing about, you know, spirituality because spirituality is a very, very important part of black people. If it wasn't for spirituality, if it wasn't for faith in God or in something, we would not have survived slavery. We would not have survived life after slavery. We would not be surviving today if it wasn't for that. So faith is important. It's, and he demonstrates that not just in people that go to church, but when he tapped on these culturals, cultural religions and belief, things that have been going on in, in our households naturally, nothing to us, you know? You know, somebody cut a chicken in the back and did a circle and did, oh, there's going to be a ceremony. We're going to be back. That's nothing to some of us. And in some hey, cultures. This is what I come from. Like people, you know, people <laughs> like to talk about Haiti. Oh my God, that was like, we, we, I'm not, the revolution begins because there's a ceremony. That's right. They got, you, they got together and they said, no, nah, it's time. It's time. Heavy. No one of seven guitars when I saw it open like that. Wow. The ceremony. Go ahead, Regine. The ceremony. <laughs> Because it opened, I said, "Whoa, why are they cutting it?" And then that was the ceremony. How many play? How many times in each of his plays does he? Is there a ceremony before the play continues? Now I want to pay attention to all the plays and pay attention <laughs> to the detail of how many times in the, where in the play does he start? Does it, is there a ceremony before the real play unravels? You know. Or what are the plays that end with the ceremony? It makes right. me think of Gabriel and his trumpet at the end. And, <clears throat> and there are very specific folks in the audience who laugh at that and write it off. And there are other people who are gutted by that because 
to Gabriel and to Troy's family, that moment of him letting Peter know to open the gates is real. Right. And to Gabriel, that has to happen in order for Troy to to access what is his in his afterlife. Right. And it's I mean to be uh, the namesake right. of of the of the one who's gonna open the gates, right? I mean, yeah, you know your if you know your musical theater, there's a whole song about Gabriel mm. blowing a horn so the gates yeah. to heaven can open up. Right. And if you know that you should know the power of that moment if the, if it doesn't work. Ooh. And yeah. the fact that Gabriel was 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 I'm, I'm sorry, Keith. I know you. The fact that Gabriel was injured, Gabriel was not in his right complete mind, and that right. you know, and it be the one that you look strange is the one that's tapped, that's touched, the one that's connected to God most. You it's know, it's the other link to Shakespeare. Yes. Shakespeare's fools are the ones who are speaking the truth and sending the audience their message. Gabriel is the one who's speaking truth and sending the audience that message. Right, right. And it's also, it, a, comment, it, it's also it. comment on, it's a comment on mental health. Yep, as well. 100%. Yeah. Right? And the stigma around that, the stigma absolutely. Around that. But I think also too, the um, before it was the ceremony, it was the ritual. Mm. Right? It's the mm. ritual in Africa. Mm. Right. right. And so now since it's traveled, to different different places or whatever, probably through all the plays, it is the ceremony. Because mm -hmm. there's that, a that ritual. Original, church. That original original comes from Africa. Mm -hmm. I have the the task to keep us on task. This is a beautiful discussion. My hope is that folks who are listening are going to go sort of read the plays. You should read Ma Rainey's because a lot of this. Um, interaction of the band in the room is removed because films historically need to be between a certain amount of time and right. August Wilson wrote what he needed to write to tell the story of his characters. Right. Um, so there's much more to the play that will fill out some of what you're hearing us talk about. Um, I have two questions. The first one is about our Boston Regional August Wilson monologue competition. Uh, this is a national monologue program competition for high school students that is run by the True Colors Theater Company in Atlanta, Georgia, a very well-known, well-respected, and incredible black theater down in Atlanta. There are 19 partner cities, and we have been one of those partner cities for the last 11 years. So we go into Boston Public Schools and offer residencies that not only coach students on monologues, but also work with their classroom teachers to do this, to teach them about August Wilson and his history and why he's so important to the theater canon and why young people should know him. There's a lot more to the program, but I wanna to get to my question for the three of you, all of whom teach for this program. And Regine um, is the primary manager and accompanies our champions to the nationals. Um, why is it so important for young people to know and understand the importance of August Wilson. Why Why do we do this monologue competition? Why is it so important for students to be studying August alongside a Shakespeare? Uh, what's what's a, there's no concise answer to this question, but like one, I, I will make an attempt. Um, I will say, so, so I didn't say this when I introduced myself, but I am, one of the things that I also do is study Shakespeare. Um, mm. I perform it, but I also study it. Uh, it, it was, I, I've done two, I've been in two master's programs focusing on Shakespeare and his work. So I've, I've read it as literary text. I've read it as dramatic text to be performed. I thought about the history of its performance and how it gets performed. I thought about it in all sorts of crazy uh, literary critical ways. Um, and I love it. I love Shakespeare. And the only other playwright I have encountered that I have been able to be as passionate about and as interested in and as, and I found um, as urgent, if not more urgent, is August Wilson. Because I think culturally, um, the more, full stop, the more playwrights of color, the more black playwrights we know, the better. And we know the way to do that is in schools. Shakespeare's been around for 400 years. Why? Because we put him into the curriculum. You have a student who encounters Shakespeare in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and I have students in the program who don't know August Wilson exists until this program comes up all of a sudden in the fall. And that's insane. 
because the 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 man wrote too many plays to not be known um, more <laughs> widely um, than he is. Um, and the I mean, and and we see this as teachers, the effect of encountering the work of an individual who um, has a story that is like yours is tremendously impactful. Um, whether it's an it's an in an English language arts class or English as a second language class, or it's in a class where students have to have um, specific or particular needs, the it, it is a moment where you see them truly empowered um, to not just kind of come into their own and find their confidence and find um, their own ways of storytelling. Um, you you see them kind of realize, oh right, my story matters. And I can take up space and tell my story. And guess what? You will listen to me because my story is worth the telling and it is worth the hearing. And if you don't listen to it, that's your loss. But I'm going to say it anyway. And that's how August Wilson wrote. Um, I think that's why he wrote. That's how he wrote. And it is, it's is—it's an incredible um, experience for students to figure out how to do that on their own. And, and the reality of the situation is, you know, um, yeah, Arthur Miller's great. Regina O'Neill's great. Tennessee Williams is great. But if you really want to think about what American theater is and what it can be, it is the work of August Wilson that shows us that. Um, because like Meg said, he's our Shakespeare, not because like, not just because he wrote 10 plays, but because there's a scale and a scope to the work that told is story. across the plays. Oh, and he wrote more than just 10 plays. Right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're just talking about these 10 plays and what they are as just an opus, um, it, it, you know, and, and if you want to understand the comparative, the, the com not the comparison, you want to understand why Shakespeare kind of like is the way to understand this, think of the history plays, beginning with King John up through Henry VIII and a couple more if you really want to tack it on and do the history plays. That, that cycle of 10, 11 plays, that's what the history cycle does. And it's and somehow it's 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 got the same scope, the number of characters, scope of experience, topics, themes. It's it's insane. And and our students should know that it's not just Shakespeare who did it. Um, there, there's this there's this black man who sat down and said, "I'm gonna do this," um, and then did it. And and it's a powerful thing. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why she manages the program. <laughs> Um, Keith, I'd love to hear your response on this, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna throw my my next question to you all. Um, you are the producer and the creator and the actor in Triggered Life, which deals with mental health and trauma, specifically in Black men. So I'm interested to hear your perspective on why it's so important for young men of color, specifically, to know this work and to have access to this work. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that and how you see sort of one serving the other in this larger conversation we've sort of touched on about mental health? Yeah, I think I think one thing, uh, first of all, Regine, that was awesome. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, uh, here's my thoughts in general. First of all, we're talking about Shakespeare and we're talking about August Wilson. So can you do... <laughs> Can you do Shakespeare in an August Wilson tempo? We're going to find out because Regina and I was talking about something like that, Keith. Can you do, <laughs> can you do, can you do Shakespeare in an August Wilson tempo or can you do August Wilson tempo with a Shakespeare monologue? I that's think it's happening. I, that's what, that's what, that's what it is. We ain't got time now because I can do it. But let me tell you what works. Let me tell you what works. What works is Shakespeare in an August Wilson tempo. It don't work the other way. Right, right. So that tells you because we have too many actors who can hide in Shakespeare who can't act. You can't hide in Wilson. Mm, you got to come from the gut. You, can, mm. you have to come from the gut. And mm -hmm. as soon as you don't have tempo, it doesn't sound right. You sound funny. You can't, you know what I mean? You can't slow it down. That's why I'm, I'm always a stickler about it, that our kids have to be at tempo. Because if not, it, it's not hard, right? It's, it's not hard. to slow right. it down and not have that, that Pittsburgh speed to it, 
Yep. Then it's, you know, but Shakespeare, you can slow it down as much as you want and nobody really cares. Nobody yep. says anything about it. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? So most people don't know the tempo. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you can hide. And once you get that meter, like after you get that meter once, like that's it. Like what else is there to do? That's so I'm gonna so I'm gonna throw that at you real quick because <laughs> I know it's gonna get you mad. Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disagree. I'm not gonna disagree with you. No, no, no. I, I, you'd be surprised the things I have to say about Shakespeare and actors. But please go on. <laughs> yeah, um, you know what I'm saying? And then people have to always have to have an accent. You know what I mean? I'm a more all the time in Shakespeare. That's what I'm covered with. Because some people try to try to do that X. No, I'm a more. So that's that's another comment I have. But this is I think it's. One thing is you, we got to see greatness. And for, you know, for, for our males, it's important that they see greatness, right? And that they see, see characters that are vulnerable, mm -hmm. right? And have their own mental health issues, right? And it's, it's, something, it's something really powerful about even the quotes. You got to get right with yourself before you get right with anybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I start with that. And that's something that, that that's important that sometimes, you know, young black and brown men don't hear about, right? The importance of self, the importance of self-love, the importance of taking care of yourself, mm. you know, and that is, that's important. But also with these monologues, unapologetically black, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the voices are strong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, that young folks don't, don't get don't get to see as much, mm -hmm. right? A lot of the black, a lot of the kids in general find their voices, but there's something powerful about young black and brown men finding their voices mm -hmm. through these monologues, right? Mm -hmm. No matter what it, whether it's slow drag, mm -hmm. you know, which is a different, which is different. But now the fact that they can pick whatever monologue they want, like magic, magic is happening in a different way. Um and being able to discover your voice mm. and figure out how to be present for two minutes, because that's the other thing too, is being present for two minutes and being vulnerable for two minutes. And it causes them to have to redefine what they've been told about manhood. There it is. Well. Mm. There it is. That is really, really key. Because mm -hmm. folks really have to be like, can I say this? No, 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 yes. Can I, can I show emotion? Yes, you can. Because these characters do all of that mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. being able to use that as an example and be able to also model that mm -hmm. when, doing, when doing a monologue for them mm -hmm. so they can understand that, mm -hmm. then we're embodying, we're embodying Wilson's voice. Mm -hmm. right? And, um, for young black and brown men to see that is huge. It's really, really huge as they're trying to find themselves. Um, so that's why I think uh, it's a great question. That's why I think that's uh, really, really important. And um, I've been blessed uh, to be doing this for, for a good while and be able to see, to be able to see them find their voice or question. You know, not many people pick that Levy monologue, you know, um, but. I always try to I always try to do it um, for them because there's so much there's so much in there and this trauma this serious trauma that he witnessed um, yeah and also he he, he gets triggered yeah <laughs> he gets triggered all the time and it's a discussion that we have yeah so. And I know I just something that like Keith said, I just want to point on, you know, the 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 idea that young people, young black and brown boys, but you know, also I would say, you know, young black and brown girls yeah. need to experience what it feels like to be great, but not great because you're a king or a celebrity or you know what what we think of as great capital G, but these are everyday people. Right living these lives that are mm -hmm. um that that feel big and feel large yes be simply because they are lives that are being lived yes and they're real yeah. right yeah Ro Ro right. said it right. best sometimes you you know you you fill up that house you right. know the characters right. were big and they were and they, and and you know I, I, i'm i'm hearing you all about you know what's important for young 
black boys. I had the opportunity to see, uh, young, you know, these these little uh, teenage kids I take to New York to go to this national competition. They come back young men and women. You're right, Keith. They find their voices. They find out who they are and they can identify to these characters because there's other solutions. I think these characters, just like in Shakespeare, present solutions, another way to work it out, you yeah. know, and another way to see yourself. Yeah. And to know that it's okay to be vulnerable because you don't know how to stand up. Yeah. Right. All of the women stood up. Right. Even yeah. when they were breaking down, they yeah. always stood up. You know. Yeah, I yeah. I really love that you brought that up because because those of us who have read the the cycle notice how few women there are in the entire canon, but every single one of them is fully developed, fully fleshed out, is there for reasons beyond serving the men that are around her. Um, which happens a lot in in our uh, the playwrights in in my ancestry, um, and happens a lot in Shakespeare. The women are only there in service of the men, and that is not true for any of the women in Wilson's canon. Um, yeah. I I want to encourage all of you who are listening in. Thank you so much for being here again tonight to go back to Netflix and do a search for a documentary called Giving Voice. This is a documentary about this monologue competition that was filmed in 2018, but was released just a week or so before Ma Rainey was released on Netflix. We, the four of us could spend another six hours talking about the program, the importance of this program for any young person across the country, regardless of their um, race or ethnicity. It is important for every child to read and understand this work and the importance of this work. And giving voice taps into the power of this experience that we've all witnessed in the work that we do. Um, and it's available at any time uh, on Netflix. I, I also want to talk about um, a keynote speech that August Wilson gave 25 years ago, which is sort of blowing my mind um, as I was prepping for tonight. Um, but it's now a speech that's called The Ground on Which I Stand. Mm. And if you are looking for a piece of text that could give you a snapshot into the mind and the passion and the brilliance and the genius that was August Wilson, you should read this entire speech. It's available online. This was a keynote speech on June 26th, 1996 at the Theater Communications Group National Conference. And I'm gonna read two quotes. The first is this. I believe in the American theater. I believe in its power to inform about the human condition. I believe in its power to heal to hold the mirror as to her up to nature, to the truths we uncover, to the truths we wrestle from uncertain and sometimes unyielding realities. All of art is a search for ways of being, of living life more fully. And then I'm gonna read one more quote and I'm gonna give you your question to think about while I read this quote for everyone. If you could ask August Wilson, and I'm, I'm surprising you with this, this wasn't in your prep materials, full disclosure. But I've been thinking a lot about the events that happened in Minnesota yesterday and mm -hmm. that keep happening across this country. And I keep wondering what would August Wilson be writing about this moment? Um, and I'm gonna read this next quote because it speaks to what he has done for black playwrights and black artists in America. And while I'm reading, I want the three of you to think about what's the one question that you would ask him if you had 10 minutes in that booth at UNO's after a rehearsal at the Huntington, what would you ask him? And the quote is this, this brilliant explosion of black arts and letters in the 60s remains for me the hallmark and the signpost that points the way to our contemporary work on the same ground. Black playwrights everywhere remain indebted to them for their brave and courageous forays into an area that is marked with landmines and the shadows of snipers. Mm. Those who would reserve the territory of arts and letters and the American theater as their own special province and point blacks toward the ball fields and the bandstands. 25 years ago, he wrote and delivered this speech to the American theater industry, calling it out, 
on funding for black theater and black artists, for access to productions and space to create. And I share this quote because we are all in the moment of witnessing August Wilson doing the same thing that he spoke about 25 years ago, which is opening more doors for black artists. Joe Turner's Come and Gone was the first production produced at the Huntington Theater Company. And it's famous at the Huntington because Kirsten Greenwich talks about being in the student matinee house of that play in the 80s here in Boston. And that is the moment where she saw herself on stage. So it goes back to that idea of representation and knew that she wanted a life in the theater. And Kirsten Greenwich is now a nationally known and incredible playwright in her own right. She's been produced at the Huntington. She's a good friend of our department. Um, so I also want to offer the three of you um, a, a thank you and an affirmation that 25 years ago, this incredible man that we are all not so secretly obsessed with gave this call to action and that you are actually the artists doing the work to continue to open these pathways that he's talked about. And Ma Rainey being on Netflix is opening pathways. We are all desperate for the return to live theater on stage. But I have to tip my hat to Mr. Denzel Washington, who has committed to producing all 10 of these plays on film because he believes so strongly in making sure that as many people as possible access this work and keep this work happening. He started with Fences, Ma Rainey's is up and running, and in a couple of years, we're gonna get the piano lesson back on Broadway. And if I'm remembering correctly, that same cast will then film it, which is exceptional. So I thank you, and I'm gonna leave it to you to close us out with your thoughts of in this moment of us just creating more questions necessarily than answers and more discussion, what would you ask him? <clears throat> I would definitely uh, say, well, August, you already wrote a lot about what's going on presently because you got Solly Two Kings coming to report that they're riding down there and, and they and, and they police is trampling people and people are getting killed. So what more can you write about in this present day? How would you tell the story that you've been telling for years. Um, the one thing I probably might ask August Wilson is, um, are you satisfied? Do you feel like you've done the job? Are you satisfied and do you feel that you've done the job? I think I know what his answer might be based on what I have learned about August Wilson. You know, and oh, by the way, you think it was something to see the plays on movies. How about when the man tells you this is, a, this is gonna happen, and two, three years later, you're watching it. And with, if anybody wants to know, Denzel and I had an opportunity to talk, and he <laughs> told me about this. I don't, yeah, and he told me about this, and I thought it was neat. Um, <laughs> but it, it, I thought it was neat. I didn't, you know, and then to see it happens, like, well, shoot, how I get on? I blew my, ch Denzel, give me the movie, give me the movie. But um, the real question is, yeah, um, are you satisfied? And do you think you've done the job? And I think he would say, I got more work to do. That's what I think he would say. Mm. Go ahead, sister. Oh, I, I, I'm still thinking. You're thinking? All right, I'll go. Um, <laughs> first thing I was asking was, can you write a play for me and Naheem? Hell yeah! <laughs> That'd be the first thing. I... Hey! Why are you talking to me? Like, you did a one man, can you do a two? Yeah. Like, you, what's your version of Top Dog Underdog? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So that, would be, that would be that would be something that, that I'd have to ask. Um, Thank you, Keith. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, I think, uh, but I think the other thing is, um, is, um, and it, it just went, it's going to be back though. Um, I would ask, how do we continue? Do you feel like we have upheld your legacy? Are we doing the vision that you laid out? 
I think that would be the big, uh, that would be the big question that I would ask. Ooh. And if we're not, and if we're not, then what do we need? What do we need to do to uphold it? And, and Eugene, before you really, before you go, I think another real important question that has been going on for a while is how would August feel about his work being done uh, in different genders, in different uh, back, different colors, different backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds? Because one of the winners is the, in the last eleven years is from Mexico. Another, I mean, Mexican descent. I mean, we, we, you know, we have women doing August Wilson's male roles. You know, how would he feel about that? Because he did not allow or did not want a white director to direct his work for years. That's a fact. Um, Steve Miller had to go through a whole lot just to get Ruben down here to do the reading of it. Okay. Um, So now you have all these different people that are doing his work. How would you feel? How do you how how do you feel about that, August? How that make you feel? Little girl did that monologue. That little boy Marlo. How you feel about that, August? I would love to hear what he has to say about that. I, it's it's, uh, <laughs> why do I not have words? Um, I mean, if I could ask August Wilson a question, I don't know that I ha- that there's one that I would ask. There's probably too many, and they'd all kind of come up in the process of conversation. Um, but you know. I, we, we were talking before about, uh, you know, the spirituality of things and kind of the, the, the mysticism and the kind of the metaphysical things that seem to, that August seems to bring up and, and uh, what gets passed down, um, you know, what gets held on to and what kind of is yours, what is kind of your birthright, um, your thing to inherit. Um, and I, I'm, I'm coming at this roundly, but I promise there's a place I'm coming to. When I think about my um, sort of academic career and my career in the theater, there are these weird convergences. And I think the convergence of the Shakespeare and the August Wilson is one thing. I also think that I, I got a, a notification on Facebook yesterday, today. It was a memory of how I, my first, after not being on stage for like 10 years, my first play back was a community theater production of doubt playing viola davis's role the role viola davis made famous and i remember the first time i saw ma rainey and a few years after that i did a play in which i played a version of ma rainey and whenever i i will i i actually almost didn't i have still have yet to watch the film fences because when i think of viola being rose i'm like i can't watch it because i i the moment i read that role i knew it was mine and I will not compare myself to Viola Davis. And I think what I would ask August Wilson has is what it, the thing I'm trying to come down to is, I think I would sit across from him and say, how do you, how did you give us all our voice? <laughs> you know, we're speaking your words, but inevitably we feel like we found, we found our voices in doing it. And I think that's every time I see Viola Davis do a role, specific and especially an August Wilson role, I, it's like, I know she's Vi- Viola Davis. She's not a Rose. She's not Ma Rainey. But it's the, you see her in her full power and her full, like, being in this really interesting way. And we talk about giving our kids that with the program. And I still don't know how to do that for myself sometimes. And I feel like that's the thing that August Wilson has passed on. And I, and I would just like, how do you do that so that I could do it for myself and then hopefully do it for other people? That was like a really roundabout way to answer your question. And I don't know that it made any sense. Made there's too many sense. questions. There's, there's <laughs> too many questions. Now I want to know why August, another question. Why didn't you write more for the, I mean, you wrote well for the women you spoke, but why didn't you write more women parts? You know, why didn't you write more women parts? What was, what was the reason why you wrote more about the men and the women? I think, again, I have an answer in my head, but you know, yeah. You, it, just like King Headley, which is a rich play. And it was my era. I think it was focused what the '90s. That was the '90s or early, uh, yeah. And I was a little disappointed at the beginning because I wanted I, I I wanted to see what my experience of the of the '90s was on in uh, in in through August Wilson's eyes. But I had to remember that he focused on a particular family, in a particular group, on a particular neighborhood, and and 
what was happening in Boston was not happening in Pittsburgh and vice versa. You know what I mean? So it, it, it was interesting. But yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of questions. There's too many questions. I think one of them would be, can we go to Wally's and have a drink in this chat? <laughs> Let me get in your head, man. Yeah. <laughs> Let me get in your head. Well, we can go to Slay's, have some chicken wings, and listen to some music and talk. So, you know, it would have been nice to have a conversation because he was very approachable. Uh, I remember he was with his family at Pizzeria Uno, and I was with the kids from Know the Law, you know, Jermaine and all of them. Uh, Donna had given us some money. So we go, go eat, feed the kids because it was long. And we feed them. And I said, they said, yo, that's August Wilson. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, hold on. Hey, August, can you kids want to say hi? He got up from his family, came over, and sat down and talked to him. And I thought that was the greatest thing. I think that was one of the things that impressed me about him, that he was human, you know, that he was human, that he he's a people person, you know. And when he was sitting there talking to those kids, you know, what was he drawing out of them that he's going to go put on paper later on, you know? Uh, they were all beautiful seeds that bloomed in his head. And, and he was, yeah, he was, a, he was, he was he was a straight up guy. What you saw is what you, you know. Which uh, as what's the word? What 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 you see is what you get. And that's what I learned about August Wilson. And that's where I think he wants all our work to learn about him is that well, you know you are who you are. Be anything and everything you can, but don't limit yourself because you're your worst on limit. Yeah, I am so grateful as always um, to the three of you. It is one of my biggest privileges that I am able to call you colleagues and friends. And I am so thankful to the Coolidge for inviting us. Thank you so much. I know that we're a little bit over. We're theater people. We love to gush about the work. Um, but please do check out Giving Voice on Netflix and, and get a glimpse of what we're talking about with this regional monologue competition that we love and continue to read and support August Wilson's work. Um, I hope that we've left you with more questions so that you can be curious. I hope that we see you all at the Huntington whenever we are back to it. Uh, Regine, looks like you have a final thought. Go ahead. I just, I mean, I know we're closing, but um, I usually don't like plug the Oscars, but I, I just want to, again, shout out, we, we've talked so much about Viola Davis, but I have mm -hmm. to say, watching Chadwick Boseman in his last role. Yeah. Of Levy, um, of all characters. As Levy. Um, of all characters. If that is not, which is, which is a, it is a difficult role for an actor who is at the tip top of their health. I can only imagine what that was for him mentally, emotionally, and physically. But if there is a testimony to what the power of August's words are, I feel like that performance, that performance is the testimony. You rise to August. It's mm. like Keith was saying before, right? Anybody can be lazy in a Shakespeare play, which is a nuisance, but you rise to August's work. So if you've not seen the film yet for that alone, um, to see um, somebody really come up to the work and blow it out of the water. He sure did. Watch the film. Yes, he did. Chadwick's story for me is um, another driving force behind young people reading this work because there are Chadwicks and there are Violas and there are Rubens and there are Denzels and there are Coleman Domingos. Don't sleep on him in Ma Rainey's because the work he does to share that space and pass that energy is exceptional acting. I thought he would got, yeah. I thought and, he would got nominated, yep. And um, I'm ready to see the future Wilsonian soldiers not only find their voice, but step into that light. And, and as you said earlier, regime, carry it and continue it and then do the same for generations to come. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, man. You did a great job. <laughs> oh, Naheem. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, enjoy this beautiful weather we're finally having. And we hope to see you at the Coolidge and at the Huntington real soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Peace, peace.